I'll tell you, the DMs have been flooded recently. The question on everybody's mind, John, how am I supposed to have a proper white boy summer knowing the emperor sits in chains? It's an excellent question, really. So I'm here to tell you everything is fine. No need to panic. But of course, everyone's panicking. You know, what's going on? Is Trump a Zionist? What are we going to do? Is the second Trump administration even worth supporting? Is it even going to be effective? Is it over? What's the plan? Do I trust it? Why are so many people coming out against Trump? What do I always say? I will feed you, baby birds. You will know everything ever that is important to know. But before that, briefly, I want to illustrate why this election legitimately is our last patriot shot here. We need to understand the stakes. And I know that every election, you know, it's the one that really matters. Let me just throw a bunch of information at you really quick so that you can understand why this is actually our last chance. There's a very real window of opportunity we have to work with here. You may not like it, but this is nonetheless true. We are losing two and a half million baby boomers every year. They're dying off, God bless them. And I, oh, we really hate the boomers, I get it, okay? Regardless, these are our most reliable voters and donors, generally speaking. Another important fact is that the Democrats have not won the majority of the white vote since Lyndon Johnson in 1964. And despite decades and decades of outreach and hundreds of millions of dollars spent trying to figure out how to get non-white people to vote for a party that seeks to conserve a country and a culture that was built by Anglo-Saxons, it hasn't been very successful, especially with immigrants, 90% of which are supporting Democrats, illegal aliens, 95% of which support Democrats. Why would they vote to conserve something that is alien to them? Good question. Why would they not instead just vote for free stuff, which is paid for by the tax dollars of the uh, Republican voter? Another good question. So unsurprisingly, 85% of all votes cast for Republicans in 2022 were cast by white voters. In 2018, it was 88%. And when Trump won in 2016, it was 88%. This, of course, does not mean that you can't be a conservative if you aren't white. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if 85% of my clients were consistently from Group A, and Group A is still a majority of the market, I probably would not want to neglect Group A. You know, when I asked ChatGPT even uh, what it would do in this situation, it gave me a very racist answer, which I do not condone. But the point is that the vast majority of these two and a half million baby boomers that we're losing each year are white. So the country is becoming less white. Younger generations are, by majority, non-white. And I'm not weird for pointing this out, by the way. What's weird is that this is a decision that has been made and executed as a matter of policy for decades. Like, that's the weird part, in my opinion. What other countries does that happen to except other Western countries? But yeah, so year by year, we are getting fewer people who tend to support our ideas and more people who tend to not support our ideas. And we seem to be implicitly aware of this, even if we struggle to articulate it, since the issue that has defined the last 10 years of American politics has been the border. Us and them. There are fewer of us each year, and there are more of them each year. Even in 2016, Trump only won because of like 80,000 votes between three states. And if you think it's just a matter of having the best idea as well, think back to those outreach efforts that we just mentioned. They haven't worked very well. And it's not like we have any institutional power to change the minds of these people, even assuming that's possible, which it probably isn't, frankly. And so as the country has become more diverse, you don't see landslide elections like you did in the 1970s and in the 1980s. And actually, if you look at the trends, the popular margins by which the winners are winning and even the electoral college votes they receive, it's decreasing as time passes. Likewise, in every election since 1960, when Republicans win, the trend line shows that we're winning by smaller margins, both in terms of the popular vote and the electoral college. So while right now we've got a pretty good chance of, you know, going into 2024 winning, I'm not saying it's over. I'm simply saying we have a short window of time to work with here and nobody else is really talking about this. Like just imagine what happens if Democrats get back in in 2024, you got Biden in for four years. Uh, in 2020, you get a solid four years of just letting these people pour into the country. 2025 rolls around, you're back in office. You make it a priority to give them amnesty. At that point, it's over. It's done. The Republican Party is obsolete. We now have a leftist party and like a leftist light party, like every third world country. Well, that's what we already have. Okay, I get that. Trust me. You have no idea how bad things could get, though. You would be begging for the chance to vote for like f***ing Mitt Romney again. We will have millions and millions and millions of new voters. And just in terms of legal immigration, something like three and a half million people, adults of voting age, have been naturalized since the 2020 election, according to uh, UC San Diego or something like that. I don't know. I read it online. But a third of those people are coming from Asia and then North and Central America and then like 11% from Africa. So what that means is Indians, Chinese, uh, Latin Americans, Somalians. Great. Yeah, I'd buy that for a dollar. You know what that looks like in a long enough timeline? You simply, you look at the countries of origin and then you say, okay, if I keep bringing in people from this country, sooner or later, law of averages is going to kick in. My country is going to start to look more like their country. And that is exactly what has happened. You go into these areas and it's not white picket fences and apple pie. It looks like not a 
America. And the problem with that is that America is pretty cool, right? Built by and for Americans. So insofar as you want to change that or you support changing that, then you are an enemy to the American people and you will be going back. So we have to understand that what we understand to be American culture is something that comes very naturally to us because it is natural to us. You don't have to be taught it. It couldn't be taught. It sprouted from, uh, as John Jay wrote in the Federalist Papers, you know, we hear so much about the Federalist Papers when it's about like ceding our birthright to gay race communists, but we seem to forget when John Jay wrote that Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. So true. John Jay is a great point. You know, I picked it up and I read it and I said, that's a great point. You wouldn't even believe the point. It's so great. Providence being key there. We will, we will come back to that, that God wills the success of the American nation. But yeah, when someone has something like that of their own, it's kind of ridiculous, actually, to think that they could simply learn your culture and assimilate to that, like how you would learn a new dance or something. And they wouldn't even learn your language. Not to mention, these people are all, like, incredibly low IQ, so they can't really keep track of all these different variables, which would kind of coalesce into what we understand to be a culture, American culture, or even develop an appreciation of it. Hey, show me where I'm wrong, by the way, and I will, I will shut up. The point of all this being the stakes are high. They're as high as they've ever been. They would not be putting in the effort that they are to stop Trump if this weren't the case. They seem to know something that we don't. You know, you've already got red states going purple, purple states being solidified as blue. Remember California? Solid red state. Twice went for Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, but then after Reagan's amnesty in 86, it's been a solid blue state. The peak of Western civilization reduced to favelas and feces in just a few decades. Texas too. Texas is going purple. Can we afford that? Can we afford to lose 40 reliable electoral votes? Can we afford to lose even a quarter of that? That's the future. That is what is at stake here. Amnesty for tens of millions of people for their children. We're legally importing millions of these people each year anyway, not to mention the tens of millions illegally, the children that they have, which you pay for. We're funding all these nonpartisan voter outreach and registration programs. We're always entertaining some pathway to citizenship for these people. Foreign conscripts. On the horizon, you know, you give these people military training and citizenship, that'll end well for patriots as it has historically. I mean, we've already purged a lot of the patriots from the military with the mandatory shot and all the woke stuff, but they can't do this before 2024 because they don't have the political capital to do so. But what happens when they buy themselves another four years? Then all of a sudden, all the people who could meaningfully oppose this stuff, well, now they're no longer politically relevant. You must understand they have moved pieces into place that if given the opportunity to execute upon are going to be an absolute disaster for us. I mean, they could set us back decades in a matter of an afternoon with a few pen strokes. Why would they not do that, by the way? Why, you think they like aren't aware of that possibility? We understand it, but they don't. You think they haven't been allowing for this exactly to happen, encouraging that exactly this should happen so that they can do, I mean, that's like literally the plan. That would be total victory for them. That's what is at stake here. We don't have four more years to work with. Things are going to be extraordinarily more difficult if that ends up being the case. Reversing an amnesty. I mean, that's the whole point of this conviction. You know, the regime, one of the many anti-Trump ops being designed to kneecap his campaign, make it more difficult for him to get into office. Uh, with the conviction itself, the details don't really matter. We're sort of beyond that. You know, we're well past that part. If it didn't matter to the actual procedure, then I'm certainly not going to bore you, much less myself, with the details. Like, when I supported Trump almost 10 years ago, I did so knowing that someday I may have to defend him for gunning someone down on Fifth Avenue. And so until we hit that ceiling... I don't really have any interest in business documents being mishandled or whatever, you know. He's been found guilty on 34 counts of being a great American patriot, okay? So now the freaking Democrats want him to die in a jail cell. And everyone, you know, the average GOP voter, they all know the score here. But you're allowed to be a Republican and get people to clap for tax cuts and you know, the estate tax reform, whatever. You're not allowed to get like single-handedly realign the party to make people basically allergic to everyone who is not likewise aligned with your vision and get hundreds of thousands of people to drive hours to your rallies, scream that they love you, fly your name in their front yard as a symbol of an American identity that is independent from the American state's betrayal of its own people. That is what you are not allowed to do. That's why Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama, these guys are all freaking war criminals or whatever. Bush was literally Hitler, but now they're all hanging out together. They all get to retire in luxury because they played the game. 
they did what they were supposed to do. At this stage, you're only prosecuted for, <laughs> for, for like crimes against the regime, basically, which is why Donald Trump is being prosecuted. Had Donald Trump not declared war on the regime, he would never have been prosecuted. Bill Clinton, for example, famously like paid a woman almost a million dollars to drop her sexual assault case against him. But because Donald Trump allegedly paid a woman to not run her mouth about consensual sex, which she also signed a document saying never even happened. This is some like impropriety as if that would have actually influenced the election. Like American voters didn't kind of have an expectation of what we were getting ourselves into when we decided to elect a billionaire TV star playboy who owns a supermodel pageant, like as our president, not even to mention all the other things that the other side has done that are far worse. And I don't want to call out the hypocrisy because that really only matters if we're in a position to do something about it besides just bitch. So until that happens, you may as well just write it all down, keep notes, but we will need it later. What is that? Like, you know, this will help us in our journey later, whatever. And that's why locking them up, though, is very important, which Trump even acknowledged recently. He was naive to not do that because they're going to come after you anyway. It's not a matter of the precedent or the pendulum. Oh, what if this comes back to get me? When you're in a fight, you don't base your behavior based on what someone else may do or may not do. You do what you have to do to win the fight. And giving them the benefit of the doubt after they openly talk about doing it to you anyway, are you like a stupid person? And the even bigger problem is that they're actually the criminals and we're actually not. So it's not even that you care about the rule of law, you're just a coward because we're actually totally innocent and they're the bad guys. And you gotta go after the leadership. That's what they're organizing is because otherwise they're just gonna retreat, they're gonna reinforce, and they're gonna come right back after you. These people are not driven by principle or really even ideology. It's just purely resentment against you specifically. They believe that the only reason we're not all living in Imagine by John Lennon right now is basically because your heart is beating. But that aside, guilty on all counts, that's actually better for Trump because it helps his position that the whole thing was rigged from the start, which it was, because if it were only half the counts, then it's like it implies that the jury was more measured than maybe they actually were. Uh, and we expected this to happen. This was the writing on the wall with everything that they've been doing. I heard a week or so ago from Trump world that this is the outcome they were expecting. Now everyone wants to stay optimistic, but as of right now, he's stronger, he's better, he's got more support than ever, and he's also free and he can get back to campaigning, which is very important because when people are around Trump or see footage of Trump, they love him. Like he inspires that feeling in people. The only way that you can actually reliably get people to not like Trump is when you contain their exposure of him to being like The View or CNN or whatever. So it's advantageous to keep him locked down in New York City so he can't make people literally flock to him wherever he goes, which is what happens. So there's going to be negative press, but you know, who cares? Doesn't matter. It does not affect reality. And this is just the same lesson that has been taught to these people in varying degrees and iterations for the last nine years, which is that you cannot stop this guy. I mean, anything that you do to this guy, you're just going to make him more motivated, more driven, more powerful. Like there's nothing you can do. I mean, that's why the entire campaign has to be anti-Trump specifically, because the entire Democrat coalition can only be sustained by putting aside all of their competing and in many cases, just straight up incompatible interests and being reminded, hey guys, the real problem that brings us all together is white people and America and therefore Donald Trump because they view Donald Trump to be an avatar for an America that they've tried to destroy. And American patriots view him to be that as well because he is. I mean, they're not wrong about that. And they're even willing to endure a lower standard of living for that outcome as long as it destroys what is great and what is ours because they're just resentful. Like we're playing chicken with somebody who's driving under the influence. They're not going to swerve out of the way. They don't possess that instinct. And the leadership understands what's at stake with this election and their behavior reflects that especially too. So we all need to understand that as well and make it our priority to unite behind Trump, support Trump, because they seem to understand something about him and his potential, which apparently a lot of us don't still. Uh, remember, they're not even after Trump. They're after us, and he is just in the way. This is literally the case. You know, this squares so well with everything I've been saying for years and what I've been thinking about particularly in the last few months or so, which you would know if I had simply posted the content. I have just this year produced something like 10, I just scrap, I don't, I don't know why I do this to myself. No one, no one is happy. Uh, but anyways, people need to know how correct I am about literally everything. And it's a crime that they don't, but they are legitimately worried about an imminent second Trump administration. Because if Trump could really be contained like he was in 2016, why would they go to these lengths? Wouldn't it be better to just let him win, restore faith in elections and democracy, and then just handicap his presidency? So I've been saying this for a while that the question with Trump 2.0 isn't so much if they can stop him before he gets into office. It's can they stop him after he gets back into office? And there are very promising things happening 
happening in Trump world. I mean, you're not going to have some Rolodex of GOP careerists, swamp types, et cetera, just waiting to you know tunnel their way into the administration, which certainly did not help in 2016. But until then, what do we win? Is it you know over for Democrats? They're just going to go you know, nuts and just do nothing until November? No, but we can't control the actions of others. We can only control our response to it. So now is the time to rally behind President Trump and support him. And I don't know if it's because people just have short attention spans or they're too young to remember, sort of hidden in plain sight kind of thing maybe. Look at how they're treating this guy. They've thrown just shy of like 100 charges at this guy. And then last week, the jury verdict comes back in his New York trial, and we learn that he's guilty or whatever. I guess the campaign has raised like $200 million since then. Everywhere he goes, he's greeted like a king. So no matter what they do, it's not working, and people just love him more. But people are still pretty cynical on our side. I get it. A lot of them are just lying, but I understand the cynicism. There's no rule of law anymore. Some would say maybe there never was, but it's more like the law of rules, right? Which is that rules are made to be circumvented. You know, if you want something, you figure out how to get it, figure out how to maneuver around the rules because the knives are out. I mean, what's the next move? People have been trying to call that one for a while. Every grifter online was sharing articles like, man dies of virus. See, it's going to be a new, a new pandemic." Every time some like random black criminal would get killed by police after producing a firearm. See, they're going to do another George Floyd. Relax. This is allowed to happen in 2020. You know, the riots, all that. So that would be channeled against the incumbent president being Donald Trump. This is not allowed to happen now. You notice even fewer companies are displaying the pride stuff too. Like this month, they put out some advertisement on the day of one announcement, but it's not coding everything like it has been for the last few years. They're trying to minimize the capacity of their coalition to annoy normal Americans, at least for the next few months. This is beneficial to them. Whereas last time, I mean, yeah, we had the pandemic, mail-in ballots, censorship, uh, but not this time. You know, it's, it's too easy now to make fun of the masks. People understand everything that they did. It was all based on hysteria. And all like another one of those would do is just put pressure on the incumbent president being Joe Biden, who when facing re-election soon, does not exactly want that to happen. Not even to mention that the economy's in the toilet. The pandemic was effective at taking the tremendous booming Trump economy and putting it into the toilet, but now it's already there. 2020 also was still like censorship territory. That was before Elon Musk managed to recapture Twitter, which quite honestly is where all the information flows down from in terms of politics and news. So for 2024, the lawfare against Trump was the plan. It was supposed to work. And not only has it not worked in the way that they would prefer it to, I mean, don't get me wrong, they're happy to lock him in a jail cell and throw away the key, but they did not anticipate that this would actually help Trump and make people angry at them. So is this like some big wake up call for us? No, but you know, not everybody wakes up at the same time. Sometimes it takes some more effort. Sometimes it takes some more time. I've got some late bloomers out there. That's fine. You know, it's a good wake-up call for Americans who could get it and who could be useful to us, but who just haven't gotten there yet for whatever reason. So you've got the lawfare. And then remember, on the other end, the primary campaigns. He's literally fighting a multi-front war. He's got Ron DeSantis, who's getting propped up by the media. He's got a huge war chest. Oh, this guy's Trump, but effective. Nikki Haley, all these other people. The lawfare, the primary campaigns, the persecution of family, the media coverage. Surely one of these, I mean, one of these has got to stump the Trump, right? You fool. You miscalculated. You can't stump the Trump. Now you have to go to Gitmo. That's what happens. You know, you let your Patriot point balance slip into the red. You're deemed an enemy to the great American nation. And then Kane has to choke slam you out of a helicopter. I've seen it a thousand times. These people just don't learn. But for us, it's been an incredible journey and it's not over. I mean, you can black pill when you're dead. In the meantime, we are going to make America great again, because consider what's at stake otherwise. I mean, what's the alternative option for us? But people don't care. People don't want to consider that. They only want to consider themselves. And so, as usual, there's a lot of counter-signaling against President Trump. Wow, very bold. I think this guy's based. I mean, attacking the greatest enemy of the regime, but for your special reason? Dude, that's like really based in red pill. Hey, I mean, there's always a reason to counter-signal Trump, right? There's always a reason to align yourself with the positions of the regime you know, rationalize why afterwards. If you're at all counter-signaling President Trump, you are my enemy. Do you understand the situation that we're in? Do you understand the lingering threat of amnesty? Four years to let them all pour in, you know, just make them citizens by 2028, baby boomers dying off. We've lost 10 million. There goes our base. Now we'll have tens of millions of new Democrat voters and then it's over. And it's really cute. Like I get it. I find it endearing that you think withholding the vote from Republicans will make them finally take us seriously or whatever. Republicans will never take us seriously if we protest by not voting. You misunderstand understand the purpose of the Republican Party. 
The purpose of the Republican Party is not to represent us, it's to contain us. But if we can fill that party infrastructure with people who do want to represent us, well, now that's an interesting scenario. That's an interesting outcome. Because their objective is not to win in the first place. But these people are spiritual leftists, and so they think, well, if the people can send a message by all uniting and using our voice, grow up. You're thinking like a child. You are thinking like a woman. We have a very, very temporary window where we could seriously make some progress. After that, things are going to become much more difficult. As it stands now, yeah, we're nowhere near out of the woods. That's true. But there's at least a clear path like that's conceivably possible for us getting out of the woods, right? If we get another amnesty, that's the equipment. Like we're, we're seeing the tree line and then we step on a bear trap and then the bear trap has AIDS and the instructions to disarmament aren't written in English. And then the trigger was also like a, a mechanism to play music out of a built-in Bluetooth speaker. And now it's alerting other animals of our presidents and then they're going to come and kill us and eat us. But hey, you know, I get it. You know, there's always a reason to grift. Oh, Trump promoted the vaccine. Trump is a Zionist. The first one is old news. We've covered that a hundred times. The second one is also old news, but it's coming back in the wake of everything that's been going on between Israel and Palestine uh, because people are finding out about Zionism now for the first time. So it's the only toy they want to play with. And the thinking is basically that Trump is now a Zionist. Therefore, he won't put America first because the interests of Israel will come before the interests of the United States. And so we have to not vote for Trump because we deserve candidates who will prioritize America. The problem with this is that Trump's position on this has been the same since 2015. And if anything, he's actually become less sympathetic to Israel and especially to Netanyahu. But it's a model for political change that is just incompatible with what Trump was actually able to accomplish in his first administration. Like ignoring the tremendous economy that he sustained and the way that he single-handedly redefined our entire political processes. He also halved legal immigration. He decreased the illegal invasion. He didn't start any new foreign conflicts. But what? He like relocated an embassy and took a picture at a wall. So you're describing him as equal to George Bush. Maybe the problem is more about execution. You know, Trump's entire agenda could have been carried out through executive action, you know, like every other president, most of whom had mechanically functional administrations. And as much as I love Trump, talk to our guys who worked on the transition team. When it came time to make hires and Reince Priebus had a Rolodex of names, being chair of the RNC, that certainly didn't help the president, right? Like these are personnel issues and they have largely been accounted for and resolved. But okay, let's look back to 2016. It's all just repeating itself, but I'll entertain it. I've got a soft spot for you. In 2016, Trump was meeting with Netanyahu. He was speaking at AIPAC. He was getting $20 million from Sheldon Adelson. But now I have to hear that in 2024, Trump is a Zionist. Okay, so what changed? He's only gotten better on the issues. He's only improved his ability to execute on the issues for the American public. So if Trump's always been a Zionist, he gets away with calling himself the most pro-Israel president ever, just like no one has more respect for women than him. He's the least racist person we've ever met. When he got $20 million from Sheldon Adelson in 2016, now his widow wants to give even more of his money away to Trump, and suddenly that's a problem? At what dollar amount did that become a problem? What actually changed? The grift changed. I mean, it's really that simple. Oh, well, for the money, she might want Israel to annex the West Bank because that's what she said in an interview with New York Magazine one time, along with every other Zionist who has ever at any point given money to an American politician. And we know this is true. This is the quid pro quo that's going down because an Israeli leftist publication published an op-ed about it. I'm a very smart person. These are things that I can trust. Damn, a hundred million dollars sold. Who who cares? I thought it was going to be something like, but tone down the fire every libtard rhetoric, tone down the mass deportation rhetoric. But we simply don't concern ourselves with other conflicts in other countries for a hundred million dollars. Sounds good to this patriot. You know who else wants that to happen? Every Zionist and every Israeli, which is why there's like a million of them that have been there since 1967. Sorry, how does that matter to us? I don't really care about Israel. I don't really care about Palestine. And this is also cynical too, because if we were actually serious, we would be forcing the pro-Palestine issue as much as possible in leftist circles, especially at the expense of the current thing. What, what do you mean trans this, BLM that? There are literally children dying in Gaza right now. That coalition, like we said, it can be sustained if they're able to hold everything together, keep reminding everybody that the real enemy is Trump, America, husky white boys, etc. But by putting pressure on them, creating those divides, that could be very good for us. Moreover, we could be pushing back on actual neocons who are wrestling to main control of the party infrastructure. Hey, 
hate, why didn't you care when Antifa were terrorizing white kids at college? Why did you not care about our ability to get to class and practice free speech? Why is it only when it's about Israel that you step in? I don't know if you've noticed this about leftists. They are extraordinarily neurotic people. It does not take much to get them to start eating each other, for rich donors to withhold money, whatever. The point being, if we wanted to be very effective and seize on these serious opportunities, we could be doing that right now with the Israel-Palestine conflict. That would make it harder for Democrats to stay in power, easier for our guys to get into power. But instead, people are only using it to attack Trump. Hmm. Very interesting. The good news is that it doesn't matter. If these people were relevant. You know, they wouldn't need to be eternally contrarian, sort of the nature of being in the ghetto. The reality of our situation is that Donald Trump has had these positions on Israel for the last 10 years. Therefore, now in 2024, we can't support him. Okay, well, in 2016, his administration was incompetently staffed. Despite this, he still manages to significantly break free from the party orthodoxies on immigration and on foreign policy. He's improved drastically on the issues as a whole since then. He's preparing now to staff his administration with loyalists and also to fire every bureaucrat who is insufficiently loyal to his agenda, the Schedule F stuff, etc. But we're being told, well, this actually doesn't imply a better outcome for us for a second Trump administration. If you believe this, you're just like not going to make it. I'm sorry this is all happening to you. It must be really confusing. For what it's worth, if I had it my way, you never would have been burdened by literacy in the first place. By the way, this is the same strategy that was run in 2015. None of this is new. You alienate the evangelical Christians who are Trump's most reliable voting demographic, who he needs to win, by attacking Trump for being insufficient efficiently socially conservative. That was the stuff you saw a month or so ago where all of a sudden all these pro-life activists and talking heads are coming out attacking Trump for not taking a position which they themselves never took prior to Trump having facilitated the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which is a support for a federal abortion ban. But suddenly Trump is now the problem because he won't endorse that. And we're now directing that pressure towards Trump instead of towards red state governors who have the power to do that right now, that same thing. Hmm. Very interesting. Same thing, putting pressure on Trump to take a position on Zionism that would offend evangelical Christians who, as I'm sure you know, are largely Zionists themselves, or that would offend the sensitivities of the rich Jewish donors who are now flocking to throw money at Trump because they're startled by all the sentiment that's been coming from the left in the last few months, and these people would prefer that that money stays in the hands of the left, or at the very least, doesn't end up in the hands of the Trump campaign? Hmm. These people are all grifting. Oh, Trump is so controlled! Yet despite that, he has of illegal immigration, 50% decrease, and he didn't start any new wars in the Middle East. Hmm, interesting. He calls out Netanyahu publicly for betraying him after 2020, says he made a huge mistake that he's not going to forget. Very interesting. Acknowledges that Israel's losing the PR war, says whatever's going on in Palestine, it's got to wrap up, it's got to stop, he's going to stop it. Hmm, interesting. You know, this guy seems like he's in total lockstep with the whole glass Iran crowd, which must be why all of those people were working overtime to stop him from becoming the nominee by propping up Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, all these other characters. Joe Biden is a Zionist. Look at his coalition. Look at what they've done to our country in just a few years. So why are these people only attacking Trump when he's not even the one in office right now? Seems like that would be helpful to the Biden campaign. Very interesting, because remember, that's the only thing that can sustain the Democrat coalition, pointing at that avatar of American identity and saying, hey, focus on him. He's the evil bad guy, remember? Whereas Trump is saying, attention, patriots, I'm going to expel every libtard from the government and conduct the largest deportation operation in America and possibly all of human history. Um, but Trump's a Zionist. What does that mean? Explain that to me in your own words. I want to know what you think that means. I don't want to see some f***ing 4chan graphic from 2015 that my friends and I probably made in the first place. I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me what that means. You should honestly just drink gasoline at this point. Like, just commit to being a retard. Become who you are. Manifest destiny. Because clearly, I mean, you're just like torturing yourself with this sort of uncanny valley right now. Just commit to it. Go all the way there. After everything he's gone through in the last 10 years, he's now a convicted felon, and you won't give President Trump the benefit of the doubt. He hasn't, he hasn't earned that from you yet. He hasn't met your standard, but you gave it to, what, the Free Palestine protesters who hate white people? People and who hate Israel because they think it practices white supremacy because you thought that they could be red pills, that you could reach them as if the vector of their resentment could be directed anywhere but towards you. Yeah, drink up. 289 a gallon this morning. If you're counter signaling Trump, you are my enemy. That's the line that's being drawn. Are you a loyal MAGA patriot or are you not? 
recognize the stakes. There's no other option. We don't have time, as we discussed at the beginning. And ironically, Donald Trump is the only person presently speaking about how he could actually get more time, so to speak. And if not for him, do you think anybody else would be talking that way? He's talking about the largest mass deportation operation in the country's history. No. No. And nobody's completely beyond criticism. You may remember I was criticizing Trump in 2020 because he was doing things that were actively harming his chances of being reelected. He was being soft on the rioters. He said he was monitoring the situation. He balked on the National Guard, and that rightfully pissed off the base. And resultantly, fortification aside, we saw that his turnout was lower among key demographics. That's the cost of pandering, you know, when your chic advisors tell you to do so. That's a lesson he's now learned. But I was accused of grifting. I was accused of betraying the president for this. And there's always been grifts, such as the nature of politics. There's a lot of them right now. I think about how on Friday morning, Trump was sitting at the top of his skyscraper overlooking Central Park in his golden living room. He was drinking a Diet Coke, getting a taste of his old life back. You know, before all this, he was doing some, he was golfing all the time, supermodel wife, friends with everybody cool. He sacrificed that lifestyle for this country. Any one of his critics right now would sell this country out for a whiff of that lifestyle. I know many of them personally, that is who they are. They don't actually care about any of this except for as a means to benefit themselves. I mean, what would they do if not for this? Like, this is all that they can do. And that's always been the thing too, right? Like, they don't want to throw the reputation behind somebody. They're only focused on themselves. They want to be contrarian they want to have their own little take or whatever. It's like, you're a coward. You have no spine. And no one, by the way, who's ever gone against Trump has survived. So thank you. You're now infected. You've got the curse. You've got the Trump curse and you've got seven months. We say bye-bye. And yeah, you know, we're not going to know how this all turns out until it's done. Fair enough. But we're talking about mass deportations, anti-white racism, all these things, not as just like accessories, but as crucial, as central to the campaign and to the administration. Like wake up and smell the roses. I said this on Twitter the other day. It is now illegal to counter signal President Trump from this moment forward. If you do this, then we are going to do things to you that have never been done before. You need to recognize the stakes. You need to stop lying. It's actually, it's not hard at all to define what improving the situation means. What a perfect society would look like, that's a separate discussion. But we know that right now, improving the situation means electing Donald Trump. Things have gotten much worse since Trump left office. They will be better once Trump is back in office. And it's not just that we will improve the immediate situation, but more importantly, we create opportunities for ourselves to further improve things which we otherwise would not have. This is our only lily pad right now. There's no other option. And funny enough, everyone complaining about Trump won't even deny that. People are addicted to blackpilling, though, which is a cope. But, you know, there's always, there's always something that can be done. But it's been over since 2020, just like it was over since 2008, just like it was over since 1965 and since 1945 and since 1913 and since 1865 and 1789 and 1517, since 1453. You can play this game all day. It's a lot easier than figuring out a solution to the problems. I'll let you in on some good news, though. There's no omnipotent force that decides our destiny for us other than God. When we say if God is for us, then who can be against us? That doesn't mean like, yeah, how could you align yourself against God? That's kind of problematic. No, it means no one can stand against us. They might agitate and demoralize and humiliate. Who cares? Who cares? Ultimately, there's nothing they can do. There has been no greater force for Christianity in the world than Western civilization. There has been no greater force in the world for history than Western civilization. When we decide that it's time for things to change, that is when they change. That is the way the world works. The American nation has been blessed with providence. We tamed a continent that was plagued with mass occult sacrifice and Mesoamerican corn demons, and we brought Christianity. God wills the success of the American nation. Don't overthink it. The incalculables are too great to know. There are more of them than than you could ever imagine, let alone account for. Many times throughout history, people have been able to successfully reverse their circumstances by just absurd chance, just some opportunity presenting itself out of nowhere. And that doesn't expire. That's not something that can't happen anymore. That can easily happen. So in terms of our success, in terms of making enough progress to see some results in our lifetime, that could take 50 years or it could take five years. There's just, there's no way of knowing. But if you tell yourself, well, it's going to take five years, you've got a better chance of it being closer to that than 50. I mean, just look at where we were 10 years ago, just purely from a cultural standpoint. Look at now how much people are forced to just go along with because the left has been so successful. 
Now imagine that, except it's us making America great again. Wow, 15 million people just entered the country in the last three years. Damn, that's crazy. But if we put a bunch of our guys on it, we could send them all back like in half that time. We could send twice as back in the same time. It's literally just moving people around. They do that themselves already. I mean, how hard could it be? You ever play Puffle Roundup? Like surely the mechanics can be translated, right? The bottom line is that people should not attack Trump because we need Trump to win. That's it. I know everyone wants to have their little take. I know, you know, it's it's your turn to hold the take stick. I'll go on. We all think you're really interesting. All that matters is who takes power in 2025. Is it Donald Trump or is it not? That's literally the only thing that matters right now. And here's the good news. When Trump's base is energized, we win. In 2020, there wasn't really energy. You know, people were demoralized for various reasons, sort of a sign of the times. I was called a grifter for pointing those things out. Oh, well, was there energy in 20? I mean, I was energized. I was having a good time in 2020. Was it like 2016? No. Was it even close? And will this be even close? No, but it can be, it can be sufficient, right? Like nothing will ever be like 2016 because the circumstances of that will just never come back, which is good. We're making progress. We don't necessarily want the circumstances to go back to how they were. It's like, you'll never play another game of kickball with the kids in your neighborhood, right? You know, time passes, things happen. It can never be recreated. You'd have to force it. And even then it wouldn't be the same. That's fine. Things change. Time passes. We're here now. These are our circumstances and they're different. But things are looking very good for us right now. Plus, we're up with all these fancy new demographics. You know, we don't even need them necessarily to win, but we happen to be getting them anyway, and that's good. That's what happens when you don't pander and corrupt the integrity of your and coherence of your campaign. You know, people will flock to it that way, I think. Not by majority, but a decent amount. This is also a good opportunity to wake our guys up. Being a normie, like being anything, exists with a sort of distribution, right? Most people will never wake up. Some people, it takes a little push. Some people, a bigger push. The point is that every four years, we do have a sort of window of opportunity to get all of our guys to wake up. Guys of all ages, and this time especially, will say it's a good opportunity for those to wake up who have been distracted by looting the empire. You know, guys too focused on, what, making something of themselves, being successful, a cringe. You need to be on Twitter 12 hours a day. You need to be on your phone all day like me, you slave. But I mean, like, can you fault them? Like, think about it. You grow up in America. You don't know any better. Yeah, you're going to want to get out and hit the ground running. Secure your fortune, right? The party never ends. But when you realize sort of what's going on, what these people are doing to your country, a country that you love, a country that has afforded you and your family with so much, well, now things are a little bit different. Now it's a different dynamic. Now people are going to emerge sort of from the woodwork, increasingly so, as they've already done. I mean, that's basically what happened with Donald Trump, right? That's what's going to happen with the young men attending college when they can't get jobs, but their enriched classmates can. That's the mass frat boy awakening that we might discuss soon. The true natural conservatives, our true greatest ally, the frat boys. And it's actually, it is a chilling dynamic, though, when you think about it. Like, oh, they crossed the Rubicon. That was crossed long ago. We're way beyond that. Donald Trump has to drain the swamp or else he will literally die trying. He has to blow a hole in the dam. They want to put him in prison. They want him to die in prison. They want to go after his family. Remember, he could have cut, by the way, a deal with these people at any point. They'd have left him alone if he just agreed to simply retire from politics. But now it's too late. They have to send a message. Trump couldn't do it. Look what we did to him. Shut up and know your place. We're in charge. So there's no longer a separation between his personal destiny and his political destiny. Maybe there never was, but it's definitely off the table now. If Trump succeeds personally, he will have succeeded politically. If he can pull this off, he will be the greatest American probably since George Washington. I implore you, yet again, consider the stakes. This is Trump's last election. We know that. We're not getting another Donald Trump anytime soon. This is like a once in a lifetime kind of figure. But if Trump can do a good enough job, then we'll be in a pretty good position to navigate things from there. And Democrats know this. Democrats understand that if what has to happen happens, they're going to be prosecuted just like Trump was. I mean, these people will go to prison. So just as Trump's political interests have now become personal, theirs also have become interwoven with each other. You know, the Democrats, it's, it's the same thing, the deep state, whatever. They understand what's on the line. Things have gone too far. They cannot continue this way. There's no going back. I mean, hey, you wanted to live in interesting times, right? This is what you asked for. Things just had to happen. The knives are out. So the question is just what's going to happen next. I know what happens next. I know what happens. We make America great again. 
It's all there in the Constitution. Have you read it? It's everything we need to do. It's right there. It's on the books. Talk about the rule of law. Nobody's a bigger fan of the rule of law than me. Nobody cherishes the rule of law like I do, but that's the kicker, right? It's all there. It's all on the books. We just need somebody with the willpower to do what needs to be done. We've been playing chicken for decades with a drunk driver and always swerving, always, always cucking, right? What are you, crazy? You're going to hit somebody. Yeah, they are. So the only way through is forward because otherwise your opportunity to swerve out of the way aren't even going to exist anymore. Your steering wheel, it will lock up on you since you didn't pay your subscription for it or something. You, you've exhausted your mileage limit, right? And then it's just over for you. And, you know, we, don't, we don't like that. We don't want it to be over for you. We don't like losers. We like winners. We like winners. We like loyal and real MAGA patriots. So simply choose to be that. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications so that you are notified in the event that I post content, which is frequent and regular. Everyone's like, you're not posting content. The CIA, Mossad, MI6, all of these intelligence agencies have this coalesced mission to prevent me from letting you know how correct I am about things all of the time. So it's very inconsiderate for you to even say that. And also share the video with a friend. That's your penance. I'll forgive you for saying such things if you share the video with a friend. We will be square. Everything will be fine. It's like it never happened. Hey, water under the bridge, right? All right. Thank you, patriots. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Poof.